I am pleased to introduce our uh, present our next presenter, uh, Kate Compton. Um, Kate Compton, uh, also known as Galaxy Kate on uh, on social media like Twitter, is a longtime generative artist, inventor, programmer, and assistant professor of instruction at Northwestern University. She wrote the first paper on procedural platform game levels, generated the planets for the video game Spore, created the language Tracery, which runs over 10,000 community-made bots on Twitter, and invented an early phone-based augmented reality system. Her mission is to design artificial intelligence to augment human creativity and to create tools that bring AI into the hands of poets, artists, kids, and weirdos. Kate Compton. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, is my sound okay? Hopefully. Yes. All right, great. Um, then I will screen share. So yeah, um, as I went out on a walk today, I had an idea for talk. So I decided to um, throw out the talk that I also hadn't written, written yet and write a new talk. Um, so I'll be presenting on tracery today, but also some ideas that I had about tracery. Uh, this is okay, I'm a chaos, I'm a chaos agent. It just kind of happens. Um, so uh, this is a tool I've been working on. Um, this is called Artbot Club. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but I just kind of wanted to show y'all an example of Tracery for people who hadn't experienced it yet. Um, Tracery is really great if you uh, would like to generate some interesting text. Um, so this is a grammar that I wrote um, that is basically like you can think about it as running Mad Libs for computers. Um, so this is a thing that generates uh, patrons for a hipster restaurant simulator I'm making. Um, and you can see that I've got a whole bunch of different um, types of people, uh, and then like, you know, uh, things that people might have, like an overstuffed backpack or an accordion or carrying a briefcase, carrying a boom, boom box, uh, etc. And you can see that kind of generating a number of different people. Um, I like that uh, Tracery often surprises me with what it generates. So here I've generated um, a number of things, but I've got a cheerful tourist covered in mud and a feminine lumberjack dressed all entirely in lavender. Um, and then also kind of some interesting ones like dozens of gold-eyed supermodels that cause you to create stories. Um, the best one that, that, that this particular grammar ever generated was an angry nun in a wedding dress um, who came into my little hipster simulated restaurant and ordered a glass of wine and left. Um, and I still think about her sometimes. So yeah, that is, uh, that's kind of like tracery is you have a grammar and you're generating stuff. And this is Artbot Club, which I've been working on. So yeah, um, I wanna show you um, my talk. So I don't have notes because chaos talk. Um, but yeah, so I thought um, a lot of folks tonight, especially would be, um, you know, between um, Everest and Electric Zine Maker um, and the other work uh, like Zonelitz, it's a lot about um, bringing new people into not only open source, but uh, being able to make their own work and host their own work and kind of independence. Um, so it's about bringing people in to some of the nice things that open source art tools can do for you. Um, and then I wanted to kind of like footnote that by saying like, also, sometimes we should let people go. Uh, and what does it mean to let a user go? Um, and this is uh, not like, I'm not speaking about like, oh, I have a problematic user, or I have a bad member of my community, I'm going to push them out the door. But what does it mean to like, kind of have open doors that like people can wander in and out of your project on? Uh, and you can see where my slides are if you want to copy them. And yes, it is very much under construction. Oh, and let me see if I can also uh, bring up chat so I can have chat open. Nope, I can't have chat open while I'm screen sharing with Google. So that's that's fine. All right. Um, so somebody will have to pipe up if there's anything that important that I need to hear in chat. So yeah, this is Tracery, as I showed you before. It's really great for generating text. Um, and people have also used it to generate basically things that are representable by text. So like SVG artwork, um, there was somebody who used it to uh, generate programs for a music visualizer so they could like DJ a club in London. Um, a little bit about the history of Tracery. It was developed originally for a class assignment and then I open sourced it and pretty much just like didn't do anything more with it. Um, and then somebody named V Buckingham in London who I'd met only once at a park created this wonderful site called Cheap Bots Done Quick. Um, where you can upload your grammar. So a grammar is just a JSON object, which I'll talk a lot about later. Um, you can paste in your, you can log in with Twitter, open up Cheap Bots Done Quick, paste in your job, uh, your JSON object and have a bot running. Um, and it used to be that was all you needed to do. And now like Twitter will actually ban you pretty frequently, which is kind of obnoxious. Uh, but one of the really amazing things about Tracery is that, um, you know, I, I made it when I had just learned JavaScript. Um, it managed to be like mostly bug free. Um, 
but because uh, it's a very small library and it doesn't do anything terribly complex, it ended up being able to run largely without me. And so it spawned this massive community um, that is completely distributed. Um, so there's all these wonderful trace reports to different languages and there's multiple ports to several languages. Um, this is not like a centrally organized thing. It's just people encounter tracery, start using it, um, make their bots and uh, often make things that like attach to tracery or that tracery attaches to. Um, and then I just wanted to shout out the really wonderful like um, funding and support from uh, the Studio for Creative Inquiry, but also like the Center for Research and Open Source Software at UC Santa Cruz, which has uh, been funding me. Um, and like what I'm actually doing in exchange for that money, I am still working on a tracery. I won't be talking about that during the, the talk, but I will be talking about like why tracery worked for the past like six years. Um, but I have been like building a social network and working on tracery too in Chancery. And it turns out that like, in doing that, mostly I wrote a lot of code that told me what code I shouldn't be writing. Um, I also wrote this uh, this zine, if you want to learn more of my thoughts on open source software, um, which is uh, basically like information that I got from um, uh, actually the uh, convening for open source tools for the arts, uh, which Golan held a couple of years back. But yeah, tracery, um, as mentioned before, it's these little kind of um, JSON objects, or uh, they could also be um, JavaScript objects. And you feed those into a grammar um, and then you generate some text with it. So that's the way the tracery runs. Um, and as mentioned before, you can also edit stuff in Artbot Club and see it like generate not only like in plain text, but you can also see it generate in this kind of like recursive view, which I think uh, people find helpful for like understanding what tracery is doing. Um, so tracery, the way that people use it, um, here's like two really great examples. Um, here's Chani Shirt, who's a professional game designer, talking about like how she uses it um, with the concept of grammars and teaching um, and for commercial games. Um, and here's somebody who says, uh, I made the terrible bot of my dreams and I hope to make it even more horrible soon. So I think that there's like a really nice range of people building things kind of intentionally and professionally and also shit posting a little bit and also just kind of like, because tracery is often so wild and uncontrollable, it's really fun to like, let it be a creative partner in your process. Um, one of my top users, Nora Reed, has talked a lot about um, uh, how tracery changed what they were able to make. Um, so they're a non-coder, they identify as a non-coder. Um, and they've like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk later about that. Um, and they made um, over a hundred bots, um, including one that is fairly internet famous called Endless Screaming. Um, and Endless Screaming, all it does is it screams. Uh, so this is a grammar that makes little screams. Um, and then it can also have conversations with you. Oh, oh there we go. Um, so you can like at infinite screaming. So this is um, made using cheat bots done quick with tracery. Um, so uh, endless screaming is hosted on cheat bots. Cheat bots has a feature where you can toggle on that you want people to be able to add it and you can say like what you want it to say in response. So you can in fact go uh, on Twitter right now um, and have a long conversation with endless screaming where you just scream back and forth. Um, so yeah, Tracery, if you want to learn more about Tracery, uh, if you take nothing else from tonight, um, go to Arcbot Club and, I don't know, try it out. It's still under construction. Um, but if you want to learn more about things that people have made with Tracery, um, botwiki.org is actually really great and has, uh, you can search for Tracery and find like lots of stuff that people have made there. Um, so things that people have made with Tracery, um, you can make Twitter bots, but you can also uh, because of the way it's been ported to so many languages, because it's also in, like you can use it in uh, JavaScript really easily. Um, you can port it to Roblox and Lua. You can use it as a prompt for AI Dungeon. Um, somebody made, um, like, so people are making their own bots. Um, uh, these are a couple of really interesting, like, physical ones. Um, these are, uh, people use it in um, printers and art installations. So it'll, like, print out new prompts. It'll print out poems. Um, this is uh, Anastasia Salter. Uh, they made um, this uh, quilt generator. Um, and uh, well, they initially made a Twitter bot and then they used the Twitter bot to make sort of um, quilt like shapes um, and print those out and put those in a gallery. So yeah, I think it's really interesting that tracery tends to be, not only does it make good stuff, it connects well with other things. Um, what, like why does it play well with others? And in fact, like my first kind of big win with tracery was uh, Vi, uh, v, uh, sorry, v Buckingham's um, Cheap Bots Done Quick, which is like not actually tracery, it's just running with tracery. And so this was like the first thing that tracery did that was good was connect to a larger piece of software. Um, and uh, it's really interesting that tracery plays well, well with others, but also because I'm building a platform, because I'm building new languages on top of tracery and building like interesting expansions of the language, I wanna know how do I keep that property going? 
Um, so tracery very unintentionally was very distributed. Um, and this is like largely because it was like somewhat abandoned wear or maybe just because it was what it needed to be when I first made it um, and I didn't have to update it uh, much um, or I was too busy to like be tempted to update it. Um, it doesn't have really central organization or an up-to-date site. There's no like tracery foundation. Um, there's not even like a site that I kind of maintain um, periodically. Uh, I shipped it and didn't update it. Um, so ports are entirely self-directed, not self-directed. Um, and tutorials are largely made by community members for community members. Um, so this is one that a bunch of historians um, who run the programming historian site, um, a historian is basically talking to other historians saying, hey, here's this tool. Why would you make a, a Twitter bot with tracery? And like, what does that mean for our historian practice? Um, so I thought that was really interesting of like community members talking to themselves. Um, there's also very, uh, because I built it when I just learned JavaScript and I hadn't learned the right way to do JavaScript yet, there's no build process. Uh, there's no dependencies. It's just a single or like a couple of JavaScript files that you you include. Um, so what made that work? And how do you make a sort of headless slime mold style open source project? Um, so I'll cover like some things that I thought were important. Um, so sometimes we talk about retention in, in projects, open source projects, um, less so in the sort of like scrappy independent world, but especially when you're talking about open source projects in um, the like Silicon Valley style open source sense of like sense of open source software where th projects like Vue and React are open source. Um, they'll often talk about like retention and how do we get people? How do we, how do we bring consumers and users into our product? Um, and because of course we wanna keep users, right? Um, we wanna get new users and we wanna keep the old ones from leaving. Um, and there's some great ways to keep people from leaving. They can't leave us if their project will fail without us um, or if they can't build a competitor or if we have their data hostage. Um, and so when I looked for uh, user retention images, I found all these really great stock photos of like, okay, there were a lot with magnets. So magnets are like an important part of the process here, but there's this like sort of horrifying little puppeteer of a disembodied hand reaching through a, a door that says, okay. Uh, and then I love this one. This is like, do you wanna keep your users? Why not put them in a bell jar so they'll be safe forever? Um, so I'd like to pitch anti-retention uh, as a pattern that we should be looking into. Um, and anti-retention, I like to think of it as like kind of down here, the summary is you can take your ball and go home. Um, if you are not suited by the way that I run tracery, you can build your own tracery. You can build alternatives to tracery. Um, a lot of people do this. So like, like I get a lot of, um, when I see tracery being used places, it's like, well, tracery didn't quite work out for me. So I built a tracery like thing that had these features that I needed. Um, and I think that's amazing. Um, so a couple of patterns that make this work are, um, you can remove it from a project without re-architecting the project. So it's not like a load bearing pillar or it's a pillar that you could swap out with something else and have it still work. Um, the data is human readable and I'll talk about that too. Um, things like you can edit it anywhere. Um, so if I have a tracery editor, like I have an art butt club, that's great. That's a really nice editor. It's very posh, it can do lots of cool things. Um, you can still edit it in like, uh, Microsoft Word might not work, but like you could still edit it in like a text editor. Um, importantly, you can also send it to friends in an email or post it in a forum. There's no like data structure that I have to like maintain on a cloud. If I want to send you this thing, it's not an NFT that I have to like put up on a blockchain and like somehow transfer to you uh, to give you my code. I can just like email it to you. Um, I could like probably print it out on a sheet of paper and have you just like type it back in. Like we were, if you were like a 1980s style programming magazine, we could just like put our grammar in like Bytes magazine and have you like uh, paste in other people's grammars. Um, you can build a competitor in your preferred language with your custom features. And importantly, you can keep your own data. Um, so like you can download your data, like if, if we have a hosting site, um, you can download your data. Um, or if you like, if tracery stops working for you, um, you can look at your grammar and say like, how else would I interpret this grammar? And you could build your own interpreters for your data structure. Um, so you don't even need tracery, the library, like you can rebuild new tracery or like new things that deal with the tracery data. Um, so why would you do this? Like, why would you say like, oh, users, please, please leave my project. Um, flexibility. So flexibility is nice. I think this is what makes like a lot of the um, sort of weird places that tracery ends up getting to viable. Um, so projects grow and change, especially art projects, and they develop different needs. And when a user outgrows your tool, it's actually a really beautiful thing. Um, they may also need to use your work in a way that you didn't anticipate. Uh, 
So I often break open source projects um, because a lot of them rely on the fact that you might have an internet connection. So I was using ML5 in a project that I was showing at a Burning Man-like event in a forest. And because it was a Burning Man-like event in the forest, it did not have internet. And so one of the things that ML5 was doing was actually like, okay, I include the ML5 uh, library and then it like calls out and downloads a giant like model of the human body so that it can do like, um, body tracking on it. Um, but I wasn't going to have that. So I ended up like downloading that model and then somehow like rerouting that call in the ML5 library itself. So I actually edited the ML5 library so that it was calling a different model so that I could use it offline. So that's often the thing that like people have to do if they're using your library in different ways that weren't expected. Um, resilience and preservation are also a big one because you might not be around forever or want to host things forever. Um, or your project gets taken over by hostile forces or bought out by somebody. Um, or 50 years pass and all we have is that like printed out byte magazine of your grammar. So even if we all we have is a printed out byte magazine of your grammar, or you know, maybe you made a zine um, with your grammar in it, um, and the historians have that all of the silicon in the world has long since rotted away, they can still say, oh, look at this grammar, it's human readable. I can kind of understand what they were going for with this art piece. Um, and maybe I can build an interpreter to like recreate this lost language of tracery. Um, I can like type this stuff in and I can kind of bring it back. So um, I think, and like, that's not something you can do with a flash file. Uh, there's no flash file that you can print in a zine and then have people like re-understand what was going on in that flash file. Um, so isn't this just open source? Um, there are, in fact, plenty of open source projects that use non-human readable data formats that are too big to port meaningfully, um, that lock projects into framework. Like if you've ever tried to break up with React, um, you know that it's very difficult to break up re with React. Um, but can we move it closer to anti-lock-in patterns? Um, and we'll, I'll just talk about three patterns real quick. Um, so one of them is portable data. Um, this is actually not something I learned from open source. This is something I learned when I worked on Spore. Um, so on Spore, you can see over on the right, I have this like, um, it was called a Spoffit. This is a creature I made in Spore. And this is actually a PNG file. And even today, you can drag this thing into an old running copy of Spore if, if Spore still runs anywhere. Um, and actually in the PNG, there are invisible pictures up in the upper left-hand corner that steganographically encode your Spore creature data. Um, so even if Spore doesn't run, um, it's not human readable, but you can still get the Spore data out of this creature. Um, it was also really great because that meant that like people could drag their PNGs into any place that would host a PNG. So even in like the very early ages of like 2007, um, there were the, the something awful forum, like for its many like flaws and interesting properties, um, actually ended up having one of the best spore communities because people could drag their creatures into it. And then like, basically they were like dragging and dropping save files in uh, a forum environment. So I thought that was really interesting as they like, oh, how easy is it for your user um, to drag and drop like a bitsy file or um, can I, can I pet, like, can I trade uh, electric zine maker files with my friends over I am? Um, so yeah, um, oops, sorry. Uh, so JSON is really great. Um, I haven't yet figured out how to embed a JSON in a PNG, but it can't be too hard. <laughs> um, JSON is really nice because it can also turn into a JavaScript object. And so if your user like me um, has cores constrained situations, like you don't want to have a server because servers are hard. If you just want to have an HTML file that you can like edit and then drag into um, Chrome, you can actually like use tracery uh, with a JavaScript object as your grammar. Um, and it's not a big deal. Um, and I can't do that if I say like want to um, up upload a JSON file or any other sort of like um, more like uh, complex data structure. Um, so yeah, uh, like non-humans non can also make converters between formats if they want to, so that's neat. Um, frameworks, no. Libraries, yes. So frameworks are a style of program that wraps your program in additional logic. Um, I put up the Wikipedia definitions here so you can see like, okay, um, in a framework, uh, you are making, like the framework is the main code and you are making a little modification on the inside of it somewhere. Um, and in a library, you are writing uh, your own code. And then these are just like a collection of resources. So you can kind of see who's getting centered here. If I'm writing a, fr like if I'm using a framework versus a library, like uh, am I sort of hosted in somebody else's like giant machine or am I kind of my own autonomous unit and like bringing in information from outside? Um, this is really interesting because like P5, I love to absolute bits, um, but it's often taught as a framework. Um, so if you have P5 and you're like teaching your students how to use P5 um, and they're using it in the framework mode, it's really hard for them to then say like, oh, I really love my program. I want to like um, take this and put it in like regular JavaScript or I want to like switch it to use uh, 
like anything else like 3.js or uh, jQuery UI. Um, but I use it as a vanilla, uh, like basically a vanilla JavaScript library, which it allows, which is wonderful. Um, and it's harder to set up, um, I think accidentally, this was not intentional. Uh, it is hard to set up, but I can also then use it to like switch out with any other technology. Um, I was talking with some um, web art practitioner friends and we were talking about like, what captures the feeling of um, you are a, an artist and you're able to like pick up and put down um, different art tools. Like I pick up charcoal and I use the charcoal. I pick up a pencil, I use the pencil. I like collage some magazine um, images into it. Um, and I think the closest thing that it comes to is like using vanilla JavaScript with libraries that I am treating very intentionally as libraries and not as frameworks because I can put them down. Even like I put uh, P5 down all the time. Um, I don't have to use it for everything. I use it for almost everything, but I don't have to. And so the times when I'm not useful, like when it's not useful for me, I can just set it down. So never trust a library, even P5 that you can't break up with. Um, this is one, again, half-baked ideas here. Um, I was trying to think of like, um, why does Tracery feel fundamentally different than something like 3.js, which just had its 10 year anniversary and was talking about like how many tens of thousands of lines of code and how many, I think there's like a thousand, like there was some ridiculous number of contributors for 3.js. So it's like a massive project. Um, so why does Tracery feel different from that? And what does that mean for us? Um, so I'm coming, kind of coming up with the word like songs versus sagas is like two ways to evolve your open source project. So a saga is like, you just keep adding stuff to it. It does something and you add more things and you add more things. It's got more libraries, the libraries get bigger. It can do everything. Um, and it gets just like so many lines of code. And a song is something that um, like a song is always small. Like no matter how long you work on a song for, it never gets more than three minutes. It's not like you work on like um, Smooth Criminal and suddenly it's like 25 minutes long. It's no, you can work on Smooth Criminal forever and it'll just become a more perfect form of three minutes. Um, and also because songs are very small. So if your project stays small, like Tracery, so tr Tracery has stayed very small, even if I'd kept working on Tracery uh, and I've kept working on Tracery too, and it's actually just getting smaller. Um, like it's, it got like slightly larger than Tracery and now it's like almost about the same size as Tracery, even though it's got a ton more functionality. Um, but one of the things that Tracery does really well is like people cover Tracery. Because it's a small library, you can make a Tracery, like you can, basically do basic tracery in like about three lines of JavaScript. Um, we've assigned it as, uh, we've assigned students to make a tracery clone in uh, C as an intro experience. So you can just like make your own tracery because it's a very, very tiny short song. It's really easy to basically karaoke tracery. Um, so yeah, that's why we end up getting like a lot of tracery ports. So these are basically just like, this is the like cover mix of tracery. These are just like, and some of the covers are actually better than the original. I would, I would consider that like um, Allison Parrish's Python tracery is actually a nicer library than the original tracery. Um, so yeah, this is like, um, I had a post that go on liked about um, there's different kinds of free software. And these are like things that I've heard people mention and free is in piano as well. So now there's uh, kind of two more dimensions of how to structure open source software. Are you, are you a saga um, open source project or are you a song open source project? And like, if you are a song and you notice yourself getting to like the six minute mark, notice that you were in fact not Alice's, rest, Alice's restaurant and try to like scope that back. Uh, but if you are saga, just know that like you, like nobody is going to cover you. Uh, if there's a translations project, it will be a massive academic undertaking. So yeah, um, this is, and also that's why it feels really great to me that I have rewritten Tracer T. This is not an exaggeration, probably 20 or more times. Um, because each time I practice it, I actually like wrote the entirety of Tracery 2 this weekend again. Um, actually, Tracery 2 plus Chancery. So I wrote two languages this weekend. It probably took about six hours. Because again, these are very small songs um, that I'm just kind of like working through for the 20th time, um, removing very small notes and just kind of making them more pure and perfect. So that eventually, I kind of hope that people will be able to cover Tracery 2 and Chancery as well in the same way that like, you know, people were able to karaoke Tracery 1. So yeah, just uh, some final thoughts before I finish up. Um, we can also think about anti-retention, not just as software, but also as part of our community. Um, so maybe we shouldn't trust a field you can't break up with. Um, so this is, I like to think of this as like, you know, cats, if the door is closed, they really need to go out. Um, if you have a field that like I can't break up with or a tool that I can't break up with, I really need to leave. But if you let me leave, then I'm actually happy to stay in there. Um, so yeah, maybe we should start thinking about like open source development, like instead of being like a lifestyle calling and the, like uh, Golan's Osta group is, has been really great for this. Like not, like 
we all do open source software, but we don't feel like open source people. Um, and this is maybe to stereotype open source people, but like there's an open source community and they have a very particular flavor to them. Um, and to be a, like to be a person who makes open source software or open sources your software, um, you don't have to be a lifer. Um, and also there's no here here. You don't have to think about, do I belong here? Because there's no here. It's just a set of design patterns that you can pick up or drop off. You don't have to like buy the beard and the hoodie. So yeah, I'd like us to think just kind of as a final takeaway of the difference between clubhouses and takeout windows. So this is more, I'm dropping more metaphors on y'all, um, but there's a book um, in I think circa 2000, early 2000s called Unlocking the Clubhouse. Um, and this book was about um, women who, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> women who entered the CMU computer science department um, and whether or not they stayed in or whether or not they dropped out um, with the the premise that like women dropping out of computer science was a bad thing um, and bad for gender parity and bad for the field in general. Um, and that's like, that's good and important work to do. And like the book is in fact really interesting and I think probably still like relevant today. Um, but also I think we need to change the framing a little bit, like shift the framing. Um, do we need to get everybody in STEM? So STEM is high paying, like capitalist hellscape and all that. If you like want to support your family uh, and friends and stuff, then like getting a well-paying STEM job um, is a good way to do that. And there's reasons to do that. Um, but our idea that like, okay, we're going to fix America by getting everybody into STEM classes that you often see in like grants and funding opportunities. Um, maybe we should consider like not doing that. Like maybe not everybody has to leave where they are and migrate to STEM. Um, so maybe they don't have to come into the clubhouse. Maybe they don't have to become members and like change where they are. Um, so think instead about takeout windows. So like you have some some tools like Tracery. Tracery is a really great takeout window. A lot of people come in, use Tracery for a tiny little bit of code or maybe just make a single Twitter bot and then they wander back off to doing their normal life. Um, there's an artist named Johnny Sun who um, he writes books like beautiful, like thought provoking books about like being sad and having anxiety and they're like, it's like shelf seller scene for grad school anxiety. Um, and he also made a little Twitter bot and he just like made that little Twitter bot um, and I don't think he's made any other Twitter bots and that's fine. Like he came in made a really wonderful Twitter bot and like he, he got his takeout and left. Um, so I think that's a really th interesting thing to consider. Like how, how easily can people come take what they need and go back to their communities like the programming historian. Um, so yeah, this is my personal motto that I've been working on for like a number of years and I think it's pretty good. Um, bringing AI to the people that AI doesn't deserve which kind of frames it as the like, okay, how do I bring tools to people or how do I like provide a table full of tools for people to take without my permission um, that AI doesn't deserve, that they don't have to come to AI um, via AI is <coughs> just a gift. So yeah, um, I'll minimize this and then, okay, cool. Now I can see chat windows and I can stop sharing. So any questions? Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I will, I'll manage some questions from the YouTube chat, uh, which I have here and also from the zoom chat, but first, let me just say, um, a few, just, just, wow, kind of thoughts coming out of your, um, your presentation. First of all, this, the small, the small detail mentioned in passing of, um, steganographically encoding metadata into PNG files for the purposes of data portability. Wow. Um, uh, but more more generally than that, and this is something that's occurred to me uh, through the process of, of sort of shepherding the open source software tools for the arts uh, group, a residency group, is how much of what uh, the work involves, again, is not coding, but actually metaphor building. Um, uh, I see this in the chat as well, you know, like Marina's fried egg metaphor, right? Uh, songs versus sagas, as you point out, um, the clubhouse versus the takeout window. As we talked about, you know, software that's free as in speech, uh, free as in beer, of course, these are these are well known, but free as in puppy, free as in mattress, free as in piano. And I think we even talked about free as in Halloween candy um, mm -hmm. uh, as different kinds of, 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 of approaches to, to, to freeness. I also loved about your talk this, um, uh, this the way in which the sort of the freeness of the software is always sort of about, about how it's given. Um, uh, but there's a, it, in talking about anti-retention and making a value out of that, you make a value out of taking, which is very interesting. Uh, there's a kind of egolessness in, in encouraging anti-retention, right? Go take it, go fork it, go cover they, it. They may yeah. forget where they got it. And that's, that's also yeah. 
been I, really on its thing. I think that's a really laudable kind of egolessness on your part, or as on the developer's part, as you know, as someone who's sort of who's 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 sort of saying, "Yeah, take it, go do go do something with it. I don't need the credit or 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 something." Um. So, uh, I'm just going to see if I can pull some questions out of here. Um, love the anti-retention models and orientation away from growth for the sake of growth. Also opens up more options for modes of consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we often, like one thing that I kind of wanted to bring out in my talk was we often don't notice how easily poisoned we've gotten from the Silicon Valley language just because it's so pervasive that like, well, of course we, we've forgotten why we want the, the numbers to go up and to the right. Um, we just mm. remember that that's a good thing. So yeah, like it's it's hard to shake the mindset that we come in with. Tools encode philosophies and we can have other philosophies than the, the one that's common in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really evident in your in your presentation. 